Ready? Hi, my name is James Rojas, and I'm a city planner. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you on a, on a virtual walking tour of a Latino neighborhood. I uh, I was born and raised in Boyle Heights, and I, East LA, and I study city planning at MIT. And part of my research at MIT was really trying to figure out how do I plan in my community as Latino planner? Because uh, there was no books, there was no information about my neighborhood, so I just went out there and did my own research. So this is part of my research I conducted back in 1990. And for the past 30 years, I've been visiting Latino, Latino communities all, all over the US. So this is the first uh, slide, and this is called, it's gonna be called Walking While Latino. So what, do we, what do we see? We walk through Latino neighborhoods. Cause that's the best way to experience them. And uh, this is a picture of a woman selling brooms near my grandma's house in East Los Angeles. She did it. She did it always on the weekends. And this is the way she made money and did her thing. And but it really kind of transformed uh, the street, you know, which which is really wide and full of cars. So I think it was really transforming these these communities in Los Angeles and all over the country. But we as Latinos have a strong history or long history that goes back to our indigenous roots, you know, in Mesoamerica. You know, we were here before the Spanish got here and, and we lived with settlements and uh, we have a long history here. This is a plaza in, you know, in, uh, in Mexico City, the Aztec Zocalo, you know, and this is what we built, you know, and uh, the Spanish came in and destroyed it. But the people are still there and we still had our practices and the Spanish came in and they created and they had uh, they colonized the new world through a book called Law of the Indies and through this book they uh, settled maybe 30,000 settlements from Chile out of California and they all had the same plan the plan was around the plaza because the plan of plaza was the way they were going to conquer and settle the new world so it's a lot of a lot of uh Latin American settlements have plazas. And basically, it's basically it becomes the political, religious, and social center of these communities, economic centers. So it's a really strong part of how Latinos see space. But as you know, in US cities, we don't have plazas. And plus, it, plus when, the, when, the, you know, when the Indians and the Spanish conquered the New World, a lot of the indigenous peoples and the African American slaves could not speak Spanish. So they used a lot of visual cues to, to, to really kind of create a balance and a harmony in the cities. Therefore, a lot of Latino uh, communities are very visual and very spatial and very sensory because you experience them by walking, by feeling and seeing things and smelling things. So that's a really important part of our DNA for Latino, uh, you know, uh, urban planning based on these indigenous roots. Again, you know, intertwined with the Spanish law, the Indies, and now here in the US. So a lot of it starts, gets kind of activated back in the 60s with the US Civil Rights Movement. Because you know, uh, uh, a lot of Mexican American youth were, were killed during the Vietnam War at, in a higher proportion. So they were pro they would be started protesting against that. And this whole idea of Chicano power and this movement started. But for Chicanos, you know, how would you make this story, visual and spatial. So the political movement becomes visual and spatial. So as a kid in East LA, I saw a lot of murals being painted, you know, on the street corners. You see the mural of a Pachuco, a Brown Beret, of UFW. You know, and again, these date back to the Aztecs, date back to the Spanish, it's part of our culture. It's the way this blank wall becomes a story and becomes a center of community pride and a way to tell uh, feature of our community, you know, visual storytelling. So it kind of, kind of, kind of creates a sense of narrative in our community. You have this building in East LA, the, the Pan American Bank, the first Mexican, Mexican, Mexican American bank in East Los Angeles in the US. And again, you see the indigenous, indigenous peoples as being the heroes, because for a lot of uh, Chicanos, they were the heroes, you know, and they saw the Spanish as the oppressors. So all this political, Technology gets set up in the architecture of uh, our community. So this is this is this is this is, in San Diego. this is Barry Logan in San Diego, and again, you know, back in this I don't know, a couple of decades ago, the city decided to build a freeway 
white right through the Latino, Latino neighborhood. So what happens? Latinos push back and they start to paint and they start to decorate and design the freeway. You know, now you have really beautiful murals. It kind of shows how uh, culture pushes back against infrastructure, political, spatial, and visual resistance happens. And then, you know, the city, the city wanted to build a police station in the middle of this freeway interchange. And but the, again, the community pushed back and they created this kiosk. You know, this little this, this kiosk kind of dedicated to the indigenous folks of Latin America. And uh, it becomes kind of this kind of identity down there. I mean, you're right, you know, so it becomes a way of understanding community, policing community through culture, not through force. So this is part of our culture, you know, in the 60s, the Chicano 70s, 80s culture. So my research, my, so we're gonna look at today, we're gonna look at the way Latinos are surviving in the US. So by the, by the 1980s, a lot of Latinos are coming to the US looking for work, but the work's not here. So they're kind of creating their own jobs. And they're, but in that process, they're also creating their own identity. This is the quinceanera, you know, in East Los Angeles. Again, a typical event that happens every spring, you know, and you see them all over the US, now in New York City, everywhere. But again, these are the way cultural practices are shaping, you know, our communities. And then, you know, so how, how the plaza that became a really important place and, you know, Latin American urbanism by the Spanish, you know, becomes a place they use in a state of mind. You know, we think about plaza in many ways in the US because a lot of Latinos come from there, they want to have a place to go and gather or what do they mean together? So it's really important to think about, you know, streets are as a new plazas. So yeah, so a lot of it is like, you know, this is Mariachi's uh, looking, waiting for work in East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights. Again, you know, Mariachi Plaza. These are, this is the same plaza being used for an event called the Pachuca Boogie, you know, kind of a retro event of, you know, having fun and, you know, dancing and hanging out. You know, this is what we do, you know, and then you have, Protest, the latest protest having at the happening at the plaza. So again, these kind of spaces are really important to our community because they really kind of kind of uh, you know bonds us socially, culturally. Yeah. So, but as you know, in in American cities, suburbs they don't have plazas. Now, the plazas are never part of the American planning. You know, uh, from the pilgrims or so that's so so again. So we have suburbs and. So how do Latinos that are moving to suburbs kind of eke out the plaza? You know, where do they find that social connectivity that they, that they miss from Latin America? Yeah, so this, so this again, this kind of gets played out on the streets. You know, these are Latino day laborers waiting for work you know, in front of Home Depot, you know, and uh, streets are very important. These are Central Americans playing chess with bottle caps and Mark Arthur at Park. Again, socializing is really important. You know, then how do we, how do we chart how do we transform mobility? You know, you know, because you know, in the U.S. we have a lot of freeways, a lot of cars, and a lot of parking lots, and a lot of Latinos they can't afford that. So it's by a car, so that doesn't work for them. So a, lot of, a lot of them are walking. So how do we, in our neighborhoods, you know, enhance walking? Think of you know, use walking. You know, both that both that both that the memory. I walked when I lived in Latin America. I walked as a kid. As a need, I don't have a car, I got to get to work, or as an aspiration, I want to walk and I want to walk in this really beautiful setting. So you can see a lot of American cities aren't really designed for walking. This is a community in LA and they have the sidewalks, you know, my driveway is crooked, so therefore the woman can't push a stroller or a food cart on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, dri on the driveway. And then, you know, then how do, how do we walk through walking? You know, because a lot of Latinos can't afford a car, so they just walk and they have, so there never be a lot of it. There's fatalities. This is, a, you know, biking, a lot of, uh, a lot of Latinos are biking now. In my generation, in the 70s, Latino youth bought cars, but now they can't afford cars because cars are expensive. You can't afford the gas. It's just too much traffic. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a, it's not fun to drive anymore. So yeah, so this is the neighborhood in the East Los Angeles where this, the community wanted to build a stop sign, but the city of Los Angeles said no. And what they did is they actually painted a stop sign on the wall, but they actually painted a guerrilla crosswalk you know, on the streets to stop traffic. But again, how do you, you know, protect and enhance your community?
this is a walking space in, R in Riverside and Colton, you know, and again, the walking area is celebration. So during, during Christmas time, they have lights there. Yeah, so it's really, really a nice, pleasant place to walk. This is a, this is a really beautiful mural in San Francisco on, on 24th Street, Guy Bates Quattro, where again, you know, walking is really enhanced with these indigenous symbols. This is in LA, you know, during Cinco de Villa, it's in South LA where people are walking, but yeah, the whole idea of like, you know, you can merchandise as a way to get people to enhance the uh, visual pleasure of walking. You know, and again, you know, a lot of uh, sandwich boards, again, in San Francisco, they advertise, they either target people that are walking, not for people, not, not for people who are, uh, are, are uh, driving. In Oakland, again, you know, you need an object as a way to get people to really enhance the environment. Again, you see the pop up market, you know, just on a, you know, on a fence. But again, how Latinos, uh, Latinos use their bodies to really enhance their environment by making these kind of creative interventions that are very sensual, very personal, and very intimate. So temptation, that's a big one, you know, because I think in most Latino in LA, especially Latinos are 85% or 95% of the transit riders. So we have a huge number of people that are, are, are taking the bus because they don't have a car. So buses become really important to them. You know, what do we do at the bus stop? You know, this is a bus stop in San Francisco. It's been turned into a little uh, vending place. This is another bus stop in LA that they have a, have a market there on the weekends. So, 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 so these kind of practices or these, uh, these uh, informal tianguis are what we've been doing for before the Spanish got here, kind of like pre-Hispanic, you know, uh, activity. They still inter intertwined with the Spanish and these things are still there, you know, so we're doing, we're doing these ancient practices of how we use space. And this is a little niche Nicho at a bus stop in uh, South LA. You know, again, you know, it's the whole idea of, you know, uh, well, vendors, you know, hang out at bus stops and, you know, what are they buying there and what are they doing there, selling there? Because people, you know, they take the bus, they get thirsty and hungry like anybody else does, but they're not going to drive to the store because they don't have a restaurant, they don't have a car, but they'll just buy from the vendor. You know, the whole idea of, you know, you know, these people selling fruit and how that really changes the space around uh, buses. But you see, this is in LA, you see the, the, the change of scale between, you know, car focused to pedestrian focused. Latinos well, are probably doing more for pedestrian issues in LA than anybody else's. Can you know, in the shade, no shade in LA, so that so all the vendors have umbrellas. Is there, these, these are like the cucarachas. These are the cars that go around neighborhoods that are really, really hard to walk in LA. That you know, mile-long walks and the uh, really wide, hot streets. The use of props, the use of piñatas, as a way to make the street life more interesting. You see murals again. You see this. You see this whole idea about murals and images that date back to when the Spanish, you know, arrived in the New World and they were how to communicate with the indigenous folks. The slaves they used a lot of pictograms. So you see this kind of use of you know colors and shapes. You know, in, in today's uh, Latino Latino corner stores. This is this is San Francisco. You know, these are the corner. You know, the way to have a cafe and really kind of Make it a lot more pleasant. It would by the way be a blank wall. This is a, this is a mural in San Francisco. There's a lot of people from El Salvador there, and this is called the BCA train. It's on the alleyway of San Francisco, and you see the this is this is how the Central Americans get to the U.S. via Mexico on this train. They call it BCA, and people throw food at them when they pass through. This is this is a Latino man cave. This is where a lot of Latino men hang out. You know, this is alley in East LA, Boyle Heights, and again you see the marijuana leaf, you see the car, you see the sofa, it's a Latino man cave. You know, this is a freeway, you know. Again, in you know, East LA where I grew up, the city built a lot of freeways. It can create a lot of dead end streets. So what happens is that in these dead end streets they created people painting murals. So now these kind of these sacred Little spots where people keep people go and hang out and see and they pray. This is a, this is a, this is a mural in a, in a parking lot. This is the same mural on December 12th, we see the Lady Guadalupe. Again, you see it's really been elaborate and really kind of active. You know, but how many people in the US would do this in a parking lot? 
Santiali, you know, this was a place where people, where, where the factory sold their seconds, and now back in the 80s, now it's become this, you know, you know, uh, seven day a week shopping spree. You know, some, some of these rents, some of these vendors pay here are higher than Beverly Hills because it's all small cash and carry stuff, large volume. It's all based on Latino shoppers. So this in Riverside, you know, the city had a project to enhance uh, children walking to school. So they had a local artist painted all this interactive art on the wall and they and the city then did a grant, grant to make uh, concrete and, you know, and uh, pave, this, pave the alleyway, make it easier for kids to walk on. This alleyway too is another activity, you know, people changed it. This is San Francisco, La Culebra, and this is a park, and this is very much about texture and shape and stuff like that, and touching and feeling. But the way they get, get the students to understand, uh, you know, it's really intimate connection to the environment. Swap meet in LA, this is a, again, an old swap meet from World War II that's been transformed into a shopping mall or Mercado, you know, at the Yankees. It's pretty active, you know, we do mariachi there in the weekends, and all kinds of stuff happens there. This is a place in uh, in LA where you know the, the storefronts they couldn't rent the stores out, the big blue and gray parcels. So what they did, they took out the back parking and they created these little, little green, orange, or red boxes that are called puestos. These are small Latino businesses. You could sell underwear, you could sell give haircuts, sell ice cream, but you know, really small places to rent really 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 cheaply. This is Guadalajara, so the plaza down there, and this is like what they built in Linwood, Plaza Mexico. The, the architect was a Korean, uh, born in Mexico City, wanted to build the ultimate Latino shopping mall in Los Angeles, so he made Plaza Mexico, but again, he copied the architecture of Guadalajara and just built it down there. And Linwood, and it's very popular. You know, people go there and hang out there, and this could be any shot in, in any small town in Latin America. It's like, but it's LA. This is, a, this is in Oregon, you know, and uh, this is a place where a lot of the pine trees come from and they had a vacant lot there, you know, and uh, a lot of the people that take care of the pine trees are Mexican immigrants. So they, this is their point of entry into Oregon. So it's a, a kind of hub. So it, it, this, there was a vacant lot there, so they created this plaza based on the fountain in Michoacan, and now they have this whole taste of Oregon. And it's a really popular Latino you know, party there. They also looked at homes. They also looked at Latino homes and how those are shaped differently by, you know, by architecture. A typical Mexican house, American house, and then you have Latino house. So, you know, the front, the American house had the front yard, backyard. What Latinos, what, what Latinos do to their front front yards? You know, they had a porch and they had fences. The house has been evolved. You know, kind of changed. So this is, a, again, another house where you see the old American house and you have Latino house porch right attached to it with the arches and, and the stucco and the tile roof and the eyes on the street. So it happens a lot of Latino homes also have a, a front yard fence around it. You know, so it happens, this changes the threshold of the, from the front door to the front gate. So American houses, you have to go up the front yard to get to the front door and Latino house, you just hang out the front gate. When I did my research, I talk I people always on the front gate because it's really you know formal and a lot more casual like you talk to. They make an informal formal appearance in the house. Again, this is the way so the fences are used for all kinds of stuff for sales, for decorations, you know, you know, uh, you know, this is a this is a fence in Detroit. This guy likes soccer, it's gonna like soccer in that house and they made a soccer ball and stuff like that. The fence in East LA, it's the same thing. It's like a plaza in, in Latin America with the pineapple and the fence and the light, street light and fountain and everything. It's also party, it's also front yards that use social spaces. You know, again, this whole idea plaza, where do we gather? We gather here. So we need to landscape in Brownsville. You can allow Latinos grow, grow up with their grandparents when you grow up in the Aulita's front yard and see what it looks like and what they play. And it's kind of how culture gets passed down in these front yard, front yard gardens by grandmothers. They you know, need a front yard with avocados by the mango, the zapotes. Again, you know, what do we grow in our front yard? You know, what are indigenous to our people, our you know, 
back to Latin America and how it comes through in our front yard. You know, the Yabawana and other herbs too. And then you have people use also front yards for businesses. You know, we're going to sell media here and send a and come by. They, they would put shrines in their front yards, celebrate their religion, get a dead, get a dead altars and boil heights. In Las Nacimientos or Nativity Sings during Christmas time. They're really popular in a lot of front yards. And again, so again, this is where I worked on this project in Boral Heights, which has no very little parks, but they have a lot of cemeteries. This cemetery is a mile and a half with only one with only one driveway. But people were informally you know, jogging around the cemetery, but it was all the sidewalk was all cracked up. So we got the city to cough up eight hundred thousand dollars to put in a rubberized track. And not the people of Royal Heights call this the, the gym. This is me taking this is me taking a tour of uh, Latino youth of, of uh, Marcus of Mission of of Guy of San Francisco, showing them you know what it means to look at these Latino neighborhoods and storefronts and you know how rich they are. So again, this is a workshop I did at South Colton, getting Latinos to tell their stories and use objects and play as a way to do that. And they're implying to to pop up at a local market. Oh, there was people that had to build their, their ideal city. When you're walking tours, again, it's as a way to get people thinking about their, their body and spaces. You know, and then designing guidelines that really promote Latino landscape. This is a, this guideline. We have a fence in here, we have a fountain, we have a front porch. So, okay, you know, we're doing this. Let's codify it. Let's make it better. So, again, you know, Latinos are using their. We say plaza, which are really reshaped in the way, you know, we, uh, American cities have been designed. So, and it's a good thing because now we're you now with all this uh, climate change, we need to start walking more. And uh, who better but what Latinos are to kind of show us the way. So yeah, so Latino design is kind of based on relationship to place of people, it's gender, sensory experiences. It's improvised it's squacha, it's about art making and craft. It's about a memory, need an aspiration. It's a way to kind of preserve our culture and our social preservation. So this is my website, uh, Place It, Active Planning. And this is my email, uh, Gmail address. So if you want to contact me, feel free to do that. And I hope you enjoyed this quick presentation and I look forward to hearing questions from you. Thank you.